I'm on mute. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our, our session this evening. If you want to, as you get settled, type in where you are joining us from in the chat, we would greatly appreciate it. We always like to see where folks are, are zooming in from. Again, for our friends who are just joining us, good evening and welcome. As you get settled in, make yourself comfortable. Do let us know where you're zooming in from in the chat. And we're always happy to see where folks are, are coming in from. All right, let's see, we've got Dallas, Vancouver, Canada. Fantastic, welcome to all of you. Excellent. Salt Lake City, Austin. Fantastic, got some Texas representation here tonight, which is great. Welcome, welcome. For those friends who are just joining us, as you get settled, please do let us know where you're zooming in from in the chat. We always like to see that. We will get started here in just a moment. We've got Virginia Beach, Houston, Texas. I'm really liking this Texas representation. That's fantastic. Welcome in, everybody. We'll get started in just a moment. Give some of our friends enough time to get in. Another Dallas, Texas, Philadelphia. Maria from Greece. Fantastic. Welcome in. Maria, what time is it for you over in Greece? It must be super late. We appreciate you joining us. All right, San Juan, Puerto Rico, beautiful place. One in the morning, my goodness. I hope you are able to get some sleep after you zoom off tonight. Excellent, excellent. Orange County, California, Belgium, Brazil, but we're in Italy. That's fantastic. So many folks joining us from all over the country and around the world. Well, it's currently 6.02 in Atlanta, so we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us for Preparing for the Future, Navigating Internships, Careers, and Life Beyond College. My name is Alex Simmons. I'm one of the admission counselors here in the Office of Undergraduate Admission. I read applications for the state of New Jersey, and I serve on the Northeast Committee. And on behalf of all of my colleagues here at the university, I'd like to welcome you and congratulate you on your admission to Emory's Class of 2028. Of about 35,000 applicants, you all truly stood out, and we are so thrilled to welcome you to our community. Before I introduce and pass it over to my colleague, Brandon Grimmett, I do want to go over a few logistics for the evening. Brandon will have a few minutes of slides to discuss how Emory supports its students through preparation for life after graduation. We have received all of your pre-submitted questions. Thank you for those. We'll certainly be trying to get to some of them. However, we also want to prioritize the questions that you have in the moment. In the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. And we would encourage you to use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit any live questions that you have. And we'll have plenty of time to address as many questions as we can. As a friendly reminder, we will be addressing questions directly related to the topic of tonight's presentation. And if you have any questions or want information about other aspects of life at Emory, I would certainly encourage you to visit your admitted student website and sign up for other engagements, either in person or virtual, that may interest you. The session tonight will end promptly at seven o'clock Eastern time. We've taken every precaution to ensure a safe and secure event and prevent instances of things like Zoom hacking and the like. But if anything untoward should happen, we will immediately end the session and the Office of Admission will follow up with you via email in the coming days. We do appreciate your patience as we all continue to navigate the evolving virtual landscape. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Brandon Grimmett. Brandon joined Emory in 2022 as the inaugural Vice Provost for Career and Professional Development and Associate Dean in Emory College of Arts and Sciences. In this role, he oversees the newly created Pathway Center, an initiative that provides resources and experiences to Emory College students and alumni to help them reach their full potential. The center encompasses career and professional development, undergraduate research programs, national scholarships and fellowships, pre-health advising, and experiential learning. The center also serves as a single hub for recruiting Emory talent, attracting top employers in every industry locally, globally, and nationally. Brandon, it's so nice to see you. Thank you for being here this evening. You're welcome, Alex. Thanks so much for having me. I'm going to take a second to share my screen sure. Sure. Uh, and to make sure that everyone can see what I'm sharing. Um, so let, I think we're good. I'm going to just hide my layout at the top here. And great. Um, so again, my name is Brandon Grimmett. Uh, I am uh, the Vice Provost for Career and Professional Development here at Emory University. Really happy to be with you this evening. Um, I'm here to talk to you about everything that happens after college, but really how Emory does a really great job of preparing you for that transition the day that you arrive. And so I'll be talking about our programs, our services, our team, and also making sure that you're able to ask those questions that you might have. And so I'll Get started by introducing who we are, the way we work with students, uh, no matter what your major is, no matter what part of the university you're in. 
I'll also talk about the opportunities for working with the Pathway Center. We're a new division at Emory University, specifically in Emory College, but serving all undergraduate students. And we believe that one of the most important reasons to go to college is to actually leave the university successfully with plans after graduation. And then finally, to answer your questions and to have a rich discussion after the end of the presentation, so that you feel really confident about uh, the kinds of commitments we're making to you as a student and to you as a family as well. So we will get started. Um, first, before I get into the mission and vision, I want to say that I've been working in higher education now for over 20 years. Uh, this is my sixth in the institution at Emory, and I can tell you that there's no um, bigger commitment that a higher education institution is making to its students when it comes to life after college. And so to that effect, um, we've done something quite unique that no other university has done, which is essentially to bring together all of those units and functions and offices that help you be successful as a student translating the skills that you uh, are learning in the classroom, in the lab, or the studio or stage into things that will help you forge your career. How do we do that in the Pathway Center? First and foremost, we have these five offices that compose the Pathway Center, it includes career and professional development, undergraduate research programs, national scholarships and fellowships, pre-health advising, and experiential learning. And each of those offices um, in combination includes 42 people, uh, all of whom are there to help advise you, to help you make decisions about your major, to also help you get that real world experience that you need. The other thing I just wanna mention is that unlike a lot of other institutions, we require experiential learning as a part of the program. And so every major, every program that you might be considering, uh, you will have to do undergraduate research or an internship or community engaged learning or even education abroad in order to graduate. That is new as of the class of 2027. And we believe that that is going to better prepare our graduates for the world of work and also for the world of research and graduate and professional school. On the external side of the Pathway Center, we work with 100% of the Fortune 500 companies, and we have currently, as of today, 21,000 jobs and internships posted by companies, organizations, nonprofit uh, groups, and others, specifically seeking to recruit Emory talent. Uh, this is important because we want to make sure that the opportunities that are in front of you as a student are real, and that the skills that you're learning in the classroom and outside the classroom are mapped really well to those skills and getting experience uh, as recently as your first year. So we work with companies both in Atlanta, but also uh, across the country and globally as well. Um, also want to make sure that, that every student who's experiencing professional development in either an internship or in research or the workplace full-time understands what it means to be committed to inclusion. And for us, this is a big part of what we want to do for students, making sure that they can understand how to navigate employer spaces and make room to uh, have diverse thoughts and ideas and to have a really respectful exchange of those thoughts and ideas, not just uh, in the classroom, which is important, but of course, also in our communities. And so we bring students into those environments through programs that I'll talk about shortly, uh, but we want every student, no matter what your major is, to feel included in the work that we do, and we provide uh, a great diversity of opportunities for you to practice that. Um, so I'd like to begin by explaining a little bit about how we learn about the world of work. When students come to Emory, they've had roughly 12 years of educational experience, but increasingly little career experience. And I like to say that we learn about the world of work through the media, right? You might think about um, a healthcare environment through a lens like Grey's Anatomy on television. You might think about going to law school because you've seen a really complicated case of law and order on television. And the reality is that while you've done a lot of great work to get into Emory academically, there's a lot of catching up to do when it comes to learning about the world of work and how the skills that you're learning in and out of the classroom can map to that. So what does that mean for you? It means that you're gonna be receiving a lot of career advice you probably have already, not just from your family, but also from your friends, uh, from classmates, from roommates, from siblings, from strangers even. And my question to you is, was it good advice? And the reason this is such an important question is because um, each piece of advice that you hear um, is in the context of that person giving the advice. And so what we want to do is build an apparatus through the Pathway Center that guarantees that the advice that you're getting is really solid and that it's actionable and that you can achieve the outcomes that you intend to achieve using your Emory education. So how do we do this? First and foremost, the world of work is quite large um, for all of you who will be graduating in the class of 2028, um, roughly 45 plus years or so after you graduate, um, you're going to be working, right? That's over 100,000 hours. So you don't have to commit to one job. You have to think about the skills that you're going to gain through that. 
And so the way we organize our career advising service is that we've got what are called career communities, and there's eight of them. They include business and creative, environmental and sustainability, health and human services, STEM careers, broadly speaking, law, and policy, government, international affairs, and also nonprofit education and advocacy. In combination, these eight career communities really cover the broad spectrum of industries that you can expect to enter and prepare for with an Emory education. And through our Career Professional Development Office, which is the career center on campus, you can customize your alerts to those communities so that at any given point in time while you're at Emory, you're receiving in-time advice and guidance um, that's coming into your inbox through our social media channels, as well as the job market insights, the featured jobs, resources, news advice, and career and industry guides specific to those communities. Unlike a lot of other career centers at other universities, we have a dedicated career coach for every one of these communities, as well as some bespoke programming that I'll talk about later that happens both in Atlanta and also throughout our country. The other piece uh, of, of things to think about, I think, is you know students don't need to know what they're going to do for the rest of your lives. And the reason you don't need to know that is because none of us do. Again, it's a long life, hopefully, and with a long and illustrious career. And so at the Pathway Center, we're really focused on helping you understand what you might do next. And that next for you, of course, is going to be decisions that you're making in the coming weeks about your enrollment at Emory. It's going to be the ways you're going to spend your summer, but more importantly, the ways you'll spend your first year, your first two semesters, and most importantly, your first summer, which will be one of three summers that you'll be able to spend um, at Emory, uh, back home, abroad, in a city that represents your career interests. And so we'll talk about resources to help you build that plan and to have several different versions of what that plan might be for you in college. As I mentioned before, 100% uh, of our students are required to do internships, research, education abroad, community engaged learning as a part of their degree. You can choose one or more of those things. But even beyond that, 100% of our first year students will, partic will participate in something called the Emory College Seminar. Um, and this is a first semester course that is um, pass fail that students take once a week and they're introduced to concepts of learning about Emory as a university, how to thrive academically and socially, um, how to pay attention to your well-being, which includes dedicating time to the career development process, and really to strengthen the skills around help seeking. One of the things that we're really focused on in the Pathway Center is making sure that students know that you don't just apply for internships and jobs and hope for the best. Um, that process actually involves networking and meeting people that are graduates of Emory, that are professors that teach at our university, so that you are known to those employers and those communities even before you apply. So help seeking and help receiving and making those connections are not just critical skills for navigating the college environment, they're actually critical skills for navigating a professional environment. So we'll teach you that in your first semester and also give you full access to our alumni network, which includes over 165,000 living alumni working in all parts of the globe, most countries and in every industry you can imagine. Again, I underlined that second learning outcome because help seeking, help receiving and making connections is a critical skill. And so what I'm gonna show you briefly on the next slide is a video that we then focus on in the second year, which is called our sophomore summit. We're at Camp Twin Lakes. I hope that being out here will allow people to sort of reconnect. We've intentionally brought together alumni and, and faculty of Emory who have had winding roads to get to their destination. You can find with your other peers. You can learn about their stories. I think that the Sophomore Summit is a way to take a step back. This is an opportunity to focus on those impactful things, not just the deadline or what's urgent. It's not often that a lot of students have the opportunity to come to something like this. I encourage every student that's a sophomore to take advantage of the summit. So the Sophomore Summit, as you just got a highlight there from the video, is a program that we offer once a year in the fall, and every single second year student is open to attend that for free. There's no application process. You just sign up. It's 24 hours off campus. We take the students from Emory campus in Atlanta to Oxford. We meet up with the students there at Oxford, and then we go off-site for an overnight retreat where you're able to hear from faculty, from recent alumni, from current student leaders, and also from Pathway Center advisors and mentors about how to really build that career in your second year, how to think about pursuing internships and jobs, how to make those social connections that you might wanna make. And most importantly, the outcomes of the summit are quite powerful. We know that, again, your ability to step outside of your comfort zone and to reach out to people you don't know 
in many cases will make the difference between um, cultivating that offer for your dream internship or not. Uh, and so we understand that in the first year you go through ECS 101, in the second year you go through the sophomore summit. And now what I'll talk about are some of the other programs that are open to any student in any class year, regardless of major. First and foremost, internship funding. 80% um, of employers ask that students have at least one professional experience before they feel confident hiring them. And that's simply because most companies want to make sure that you've tested out your liberal arts skill set in an actual workplace because there's differences to how you navigate a professional environment versus an academic one. So because of that, we offer starting in the first summer after your first year, up to $3,000 once per college career for any student that needs funding um, to pursue the internship of their dreams. It might be something local in Atlanta. It could be back home in New York. It could be in London or Nepal. We've funded internships in all those places last summer, by the way. Um, and we bumped that up a little bit to $4,000 for students that are looking to go global. So basically the way this works is that you let us know which internship you are applying for. And once you get that offer, having worked with Pathways Advisors, um, there's a budget worksheet we ask you to fill out and we provide 100% of the students that have qualified applications with the funding that they need. The great news is that we were able to fund 274 students this past summer, which is our pilot year. And those students were uh, you know, coming from all parts of the country, um, staying here in Georgia and Atlanta, and then specifically um, you know, a broad spectrum of students that were a part of that program and also interning in many different countries across the world. So this is something that we want every student to be a part of. Over 47 majors participated in this program last year. And we expect you in your first year to also be working with the Pathway Center to think about how you might test out your ideas around career identity. The second thing that's open to students, no matter what your major is after you arrive at Emory, is to begin making connections with a really rich, robust business and nonprofit environment here in Atlanta. We have a series of six networking nights that we've launched this past year and we'll continue to offer them moving forward. And I can tell you that uh, you know over 140 students recently attended our networking night focused on um, arts and entertainment at the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, where students were able to meet alumni um, working in creative fields and television and uh, music industry, but also in performing arts and visual arts. And then they were also able to sit in on a rehearsal of the ASO performing Carmina Barana, an incredible experience, um, mostly because our alumni are so well placed. The executive director of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra is an Emory graduate. So these are the places that we are going to or that we've gone to this year. And we'll have a new set of organizations in uh, 2024, 25, and beyond that you'll be able to attend. For each of these networking sessions, you meet dozens of alumni that are passionate about the same things you are. Um, we provide transportation from campus to those locations in Atlanta, completely free for you. And we also give you in-time networking advice so that you know how to reach out, how to introduce yourself, how to jump into a conversation, how to be grateful, and most importantly, how to follow up with those alumni once you've graduated. Amazing events. I'll be at our um, networking event on Wednesday for our STEM students at the Atlanta Tech Village. Now I'm going to share with you some of the things that we do further afield uh, by showcasing you um, one of our career trucks to New York City. We're here at the Emory Career Track. This is a group of Emory students visiting New York City and making connections with alumni. I think it's really important to have a program like this so that students know that there are alumni in the fields that they want to go into. Having exposure to different like sectors of society. In this world where you're young and it's big and it's scary, it's important to have a good foundation. If you're a student at Emory right now and you're even considering this, I would say jump in. Just do it. Going on this career track will be an enriching experience. So our career tracks go to many different cities. And before I get into our research program, I'll just let you know that next year um, we'll be going to um, San Francisco and to Miami and also to New York. I share that because we have a rotation of cities that we travel to. Uh, Los Angeles and D.C. are part of that. And so starting in the sophomore year, students can attend a career trek either over the fall break or the spring break. So there'll be many opportunities for you to do that in your second, third, and fourth year at Emory, uh, making incredible connections in the geographic region that you're interested in and within the industries that you might be interested in as well. 
I want to shift a little bit to um, the other side of the house, which is our research programs. Undergraduate research programs is uh, an amazing office within the Pathway Center. And one of our signature events provides students starting in their rising sophomore year up until graduation with a 10 week funded research program on campus called SURE, the Summer Undergraduate Research Experience Program. Students receive a stipend of over $3,000, free housing on campus. And we have participants that are focused on the STEM fields, humanities, social sciences, and the arts, which culminates in a presentation of the research at the end of the summer, an incredible program. And we hope those of you that are exploring um, postgraduate opportunities in research or in graduate professional school will explore that particular program. We also make it easy for you to navigate what's a large um, network of Emory professionals. Emory is actually the largest employer in the state of Georgia. We're almost 40,000 employees. That's because our healthcare organization and also our research and university setting combined creates a large kind of powerhouse of organizational um, you know, influence within Atlanta and within the state. Um, navigating the faculty and all of the researchers, including postdocs and folks that work on cancer research at our clinics can be daunting. And so we have adopted an artificial intelligence-based tool called Forager One that allows you to match your interests with the skills and research experience of our faculty. You might be a biologist in the college, but you want to study with a neurobiologist in the School of Medicine. We can match you there. You might be a musician studying musicology in the college, but you want to map to someone who's doing psychology and religion and music in the Candler School of Theology. We can connect you there as well. So we use incredible tools to help make sure that you find the right research opportunities and that you're prepared for those. In addition to the internship funding that I mentioned, we also have funding on the research side of the house that provides students up to one time per college career the ability to travel and actually conduct your research and present your research at conferences, either alongside faculty or on your own. Um, this is an incredible program, but it helps you build your resume and also gives you some experience um, with public speaking and uh, translating research for a lay audience, which is a really important skill. Even if you're not going into a graduate program, and even if you don't plan to be a researcher, the skill of research is an incredibly important skill that Emory students are very good at. So again, not just open to STEM students, really looking to attract our humanities, social science, and art students just as, just as much as our STEM students. And then finally, I want to encourage all of you um, not to wait too long to start exploring fellowships and scholarships. Uh, we know that financial aid is on the minds of many of our students, but there's additional dollars and clout that you can achieve through um, undergraduate scholarships that help, help offset the cost of your education, but also postgrad scholarships and fellowships. These can be searched by discipline, by additional criteria, by uh, other kinds of categories. And we also have great track records with students who are pursuing Fulbrights and also other kinds of awards. And so these uh, fellowships are open to students starting in their first year. Um, we have over 45 Fulbright applicants that were matched with countries this year, which is a banner year for us. Last year, 16 of those students were matched and actually pursued a Fulbright, uh, which is our strongest year ever. These programs not only provide financial assistance, but many times such as the Rhodes or Marshall or Mitchell Scholarship or Fellowship provide you with uh, one or two years of education at an internationally recognized school of uh, higher education, such as, such as Oxford or Cambridge or St. Andrews in Scotland. So amazing opportunities to check out. And our Office of Seven will uh, actually help you pursue and compete for those fellowships in a way that makes you feel really good about your memory education. Uh, I want to wrap up here by talking about our pre-health students. Many of you are thinking about pre-health, and this is a quick snapshot of our acceptance rates for our, our students for the class of 2023. Um, this tells you that uh, we've got really great outcomes. Um, so in other words, 81% uh, of those that were accepted, um, you know, submitted applications in May through July. And we've got numbers that are very, very far above the national average. And so uh, 19 points above the national average for the class of 2023. Um, they're at the 65% for all Emory students. And I mention this because this is not by happenstance. We have an office, again, of seven people in pre-health advising specifically that just this month alone and last month are very busy helping students prepare for the application process. You can also see there on the left-hand side that the majority of our students do take a gap year, and this is becoming more common to build experience, to make sure that your academics are strengthened, to make sure the MCAT scores are high, that the GPA is high to get into your school of choice. 
Uh, again, incredible office. We also benefit from having a, an emergency physician who is on staff with the pre-health advising office who can illuminate what the process of getting into medical school is like preparing and thriving in the medical school environment. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to stop sharing the screen with you and um, invite Alex back into the discussion to take questions that we might be seeing in the Q&A. Uh, before I do that, I just want to, again, say thank you to all of you for listening to all the things I wanted to share with you. This is just a taste, actually, of everything that Pathways has to offer. We have in combination over 350 events per year, so there's a lot to choose from. But my hope is that for those of you that decide Emory is the place you want to get your education, that you spend a lot of time with Pathways and you get to know us uh, immediately when you get to Emory. Alex. Well, you know, Brandon, I've sat through many of your presentations before and every single time I learned something new. Um, so this is always super helpful. Thank you very much. And and I realize we have not received any questions in the Q&A quite yet. Anybody has any questions that Brandon can answer about how Emory prepares students both during their time at Emory and also after they leave for what's next, please do let us know in the Q&A. I want to begin, though, by chatting a little bit about the pre-health track at Emory, that last point that you just mentioned. Um, we had a couple of pre-submitted questions um, that came through about students who were interested in pre-health but didn't quite know what the process looks like to become pre-health. Um, is it a major that students have to, have to apply into? Is it a program that students have to apply into? Um, and how are students keeping on track with their prerequisite requirements? Like yeah, that. those are great, great questions, Alex. Um, let me just start off by saying that um, pre-health is not a major. It's actually not even an official designation. It's just an office that provides a ton of support to make sure that students can expertly navigate the process of considering and discerning whether graduate school and the health sciences is for them. Not just MD programs, by the way. We also look at DO, podiatry, dentistry, veterinary medicine. Uh, there's about 15 allied health professions that we support. Um, the first thing that you would want to do if you are considering a pre-health track or becoming a pre-health student would be to attend during your orientation process the healthcare, health and human services, um, you know, career community uh, breakout session. And so during orientation, you will have the opportunity to hear more about the pre-health advising office. Um, you actually don't have to do too much as a first year student because we want you to get settled into Emory and to be thinking about your major and the courses you want to take and really be acclimating to college. The good news, I think, for those students or families that might have asked the question, is it a major? Do I have to major in something specific? Is that you don't. Um, the pre-health <clears throat> uh, landscape is really focused on recruiting students from these top medical schools into their programs from all majors. And I can tell you, having spoken to a lot of deans of admissions at medical and healthcare, um, you know, graduate schools, they're looking for classics majors, for music majors, from also, you know, obviously biology and STEM and chemistry, but they're really trying to fill a class that's sensitive to the human experience mm -hmm. um, because we know so much of healthcare is about things like sociology and anthropology and looking at our own societies. And so I can tell you that we've got dance majors at Emory that have gotten into medical school. They don't have a degree mm -hmm. in biology, but our pre-health advising office is there for you every step of the way. And there are some mandatory things that you'll have to do if you do decide that you're going to become a pre-health um, aimed student, right? And so in the second year, we have what are called mandatory checkups. It's kind of a play on the word around your primary care where you've got a mandatory checkup for preventative health. <laughs> for us, preventative health means that even if you are a dance or English major, let's be sure you're taking the right courses and being strong in those courses to be competitive for getting into the health professions program of your choosing. So I mentioned all that, Alex, I think mostly to alleviate any concerns yeah. that parents or families or students might have. And even though this wasn't the question, I'll also make sure it applies to other programs like law. So law schools 20, 30 years ago would have preferred political science and philosophy students. Today, they actually prefer a diversity of majors. And so we have students majoring in chemistry going to law school. We have students majoring in quantitative science or um, QTM, as it's known shorthand here, going into law school because they're really focused on patents or intellectual property, economics, you name it. So for any graduate program, it's important to study the requirements, but know that those are skills that they're looking for and prerequisites around courses and not necessarily a major. 
that was going to be my next question about pre-law. So you've already got it for me. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit to students who may be undecided. Um, how specifically do Emory students, once they're alumni, connect with the career network? And if you were engaged with one of the career communities, um, what happens if ultimately you want to change your career focus entirely? Well, whether that's while you're here or perhaps even many years later. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think the choice of major is a combination of both your personal passions, right? What do you like to study? What were some courses that you took perhaps in, in high school that you did really well in and it felt like it gave you energy and wanted to learn more? Um, you might also have some career aspirations where a certain combination of coursework is going to work really well for you to build the skills and competencies you need. But most importantly, that alumni voice, as you mentioned, Alex, is going to be important because they're on the other side of graduation. They might be doing the kind of work that you're aiming to do. And so they can reflect backwards and share with you their advice and wisdom on the things that they're really glad that they did, perhaps things that they wish they would have done a little bit more or less of. But the real key here and why Emory is so strong in this area is because we give students, as soon as their first semester on, on campus, full access to our alumni community. We've got a tool called Emory Connects. And as a student, as soon as you enroll in our university, you get access to the alumni that have raised their hand to say, hey, I want to help current students. You can search that database of alumni by major, by geographic region, by industry, by company. And each of those individuals are there waiting for you to reach out to them. Again, because we know that networking and reaching out to strangers can be scary, we make it easier by having some assignments as a part of ECS 101 give you the practice to be able to know how to reach out to those alumni, how to compel an answer, how to conduct a meeting if you're going to schedule a Zoom call or an in-person chat or coffee with them. But you're right. I think the full kind of closing the loop here yeah. is sure that students know that they're not alone in choosing their major. And you can use a combination of alumni perspective, but also the career communities, the programming that goes with it, and also our advisors throughout the Pathway Center to inform those decisions. So let's say I'm a first year student and I have absolutely no idea what I want to study, what I want to do after college. Number one, can you talk a little bit about how, and you've already touched on this a little bit, but how internships can help not only supplement a potential career choice, but also help with this exploratory, very natural evolution of academic and, and professional um, kind of development. And then the second question, which will be a little bit easier for you to answer, how early can you get an internship? Yeah, <clears throat> great question. So let me start with why internships are so important. Internships, again, are our way of encouraging students to try on, you know, kind of like as you might try on a hat and see if it fits you yeah. well. You're also going to try on a career identity, right? And we want students to know that the way that you come to clarity and certainty about your major, about the, even the school you're going to go to or what you want to study is very different than the way you come to clarity about the career you want to forge. First and foremost, careers are going to change while you're in school. There will be new industries, new technologies, new developments and innovations that come out that cause um, industries to be disrupted, for instance. And so artificial intelligence is a good example of how that technology and its proliferation has changed every job, including mine and, and Alex's and the way we think about our work. Um, but most importantly, we give students the opportunity to apply for funding for internships as soon as the first summer after your first year. That, by the way, is also the first time an international student can do an internship in the United States. You have to have two consecutive months or two consecutive semesters of residency at your institution. So just speaking to both the domestic and the international student audience, because I know we've got people from overseas here. So that's really important, right? So getting that experience in the first summer on special occasions where students really have a good balance and they feel like they can manage everything. You might see domestic students, which is the earliest they can do that in the spring semester doing an internship, maybe that's remote or in the Atlanta area very close by. But generally speaking, I would encourage every student here on this call to wait until the summer after their first year. And then if they wanna do an internship during the fall or spring semester to, to pursue that in the second year. Uh, knowing that you've really got the rhythm of Emory and got uh, a handle on balancing your workload at the internship, but also your course load here at Emory. Um, the second thing I'll just share is that, um, you know, deciding how to get those internships, right, is, is really about um, thinking about being curious. That we, we use what's called a life design model at, at the Pathway Center. So we want students to remain curious so they can know things. Um, so trying out different courses, taking classes from different professors, 
learning about you know the big problems you want to solve in our world and how the skills you're gaining in the classroom help to chip away at some of those problems. What I do want to say about internships is that they're not just helpful in confirming what you want to do, but they're also really helpful in confirming what you don't want to do, right? Maybe you have always dreamt of being a lawyer, but it's going to be very important that you actually participate in a legal environment professionally and that you meet lawyers well before you graduate, well before you decide to take the LSAT or apply to law school. Um, we not only have formal internships that you can apply through Handshake, but you can also pursue internships that you build on your own. And so we've got students that will spend a week shadowing an appellate judge, another week's shadowing a district attorney, a public defender, a legal advocate, a corporate litigator. After eight or so weeks of that kind of shadowing experience, you will certainly know if the legal world is for you. And you might even have a good sense after those eight weeks, what kind of law you might want to practice, right? And so my encouragement of every student, no matter if you come to Emory or not, to really remember that, um, you know, the way you get to certainty around careers is to experiment, not to think your way to certainty. So you mentioned handshake, and I want to I want to talk about handshake for just a moment. Um, it's a skill that you and I both know many institutions use across the country. Um, for for our viewers at home who may not know exactly what handshake is, how it supports Emory students particularly, can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Handshake is a tool that you will all be asked to once you commit to Emory to register for. We have accounts that will be waiting for you in the back end. It's a digital tool. It's also a social media app. Um, and you're right, Alex, many universities across the country use this. Um, the thing about Handshake, though, is that it allows you to not only search for these incredible jobs and internships, but it also allows you to connect with other students in the Handshake network. You can see which students that have gone before you that maybe worked at Google or other tech companies that you're interested in. You can see what they did. You can see their reviews of that internship. You can also get insight into the internship interview process and make sure that you're anticipating that format and that process and that experience the best you can to be prepared for that. Um, perhaps the Emory Network is extremely strong in an area that you want to pursue, but maybe there's a niche area that you want to forge a career path in and you feel like we don't have a lot of alumni in that area, which would be rare. But if that were the case, you can actually communicate with other people across the Handshake Network, which includes 15 million students, by the way. Um, so this is a really powerful tool. Now Handshake has developed a mobile app, uh, which you can download as an Emory student. Uh, it allows you as a student to post videos, to highlight jobs, internships that you find to be really intriguing and maybe aligned with your values. And you can also do that company research to make sure that you're uh, pursuing uh, you know, opportunities that align with your beliefs and values and your ultimate commitments. And so it's a tool that you're going to be very familiar with as an Emory student. Um, during the orientation process, you will actually activate your Handshake account. And it is the primary way that you do everything with uh, career and professional development specifically, which is the Career Center. It's how you schedule appointments. It's where you upload your resume. It's where you apply to internships and jobs. And it's also where you can attend virtual recruitment events and also hybrid networking events through our office. So we have, of course, two entry points that students can enter the university from, and that's going to be Emory College of Arts and Sciences here in Atlanta and also Oxford College, just about 45 minutes outside of Atlanta. Can you talk a little bit for our students who are listening who may be admitted to Oxford and considering Oxford, can you talk about how, if at all, do resources differ between campuses? And what does that professional development transition look like when students move over from Oxford to Atlanta for their junior and senior year? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Oxford actually recently launched their counterpart to the Pathways Center on their campus called the Center for Pathways and Purpose. And uh, Dr. Bridget Gunnels is my counterpart over at Oxford. And she actually meets with me once a week. We talk about ways that we can share resources and make sure that students are well taken care of on both of our campuses. You know, I highlighted a couple things already that showcase the collaboration and the great relationship we have between the Atlanta campus and Oxford, one of which is our sophomore summit. So we have a lot of participation by Oxford students in that program, and students get to meet professors from both campuses as a part of it as well. I would say that things like internship funding can be accessed from both campuses, and so there are Oxford-specific resources that are dedicated just to Oxford students looking to do research, looking to get internship experience both in Newton County and the surrounding area around Covington and Rutledge and Oxford, Georgia, but also on the Atlanta campus, we've got students from Oxford that are participating in our internship funding program. 
Um, and so there are rules about how often you can get that funding. It's once per college career, but the benefit I think for our Oxford students is they might be able to get some of that funding while they're at the Oxford campus before they come to Atlanta. Um, so those are some examples, Alex. I would also say that things like national scholarships and fellowships, applying to things like the Fulbright, uh, the Marshall, the Rhodes, the Watson, the Goldwater, there's dozens of these that help you build your skills and also get some funding. Yeah. Um, those are really Emory-wide, right? And so that office is really familiar with uh, online appointments. A lot of Oxford students will actually meet with those advisors virtually. But having said that, whenever there are in-person events that uh, we want to present at, we always send um, representatives from the Pathway Center in Atlanta to the Oxford campus. And so um, I would say that it's a really smooth uh, collaboration. It's a really healthy one. Um, and Oxford students in many ways have the best of both worlds because they're going to yeah. get that specialized treatment there. Then when they come here, they'll continue that work. But again, we share the resources back and forth between the two campuses. And I just want to confirm for everybody at home, an Emory student is an Emory student in the eyes of employers. Um, is there any discrepancy between job opportunities available to, to students if you begin at Oxford versus Atlanta? There is no discrepancy. You know, you might be a student that prefers to, to intern closer to the Oxford campus because that's where you are and you need to get there, you know, a couple of times a week. That's obviously a logistical matter you want to sort out. But we have dedicated alumni that are from Emory. We have dedicated alumni that are, you know, affiliated with Oxford. But we also make sure that whenever there is an opportunity that's posted on Handshake, which is shared between both Oxford and the Atlanta campus, that that's open to both populations. And so the only parameters you're going to see are more around class years or majors or skills. Um, but I would say that your typical Atlanta student, your typical um, Oxford student is going to see both of those opportunities. And um, even when we go on things like career trucks or have networking mm -hmm. nights, we are always certain to ensure that there's Oxford representation. Um, because at the end of the day, as you mentioned before, those are Emory degrees. And so our Oxford continuees are people that care just as much about Emory as they do Oxford and are really, really happy to see any Emory student applying to those internships and jobs. Just to give you an example, we've got a great alum who works at JP Morgan in uh, New York City, and he was an Oxford and Emory grad, right? And so he was able to host the students there. He was able to talk about his experience both at Oxford and in Atlanta. Um, and he made no distinction between the two populations that were there in the room with him. And you mentioned um, very briefly um, about national scholarships and fellowships, one of the areas in which we are quite strong at Emory. Can you dive a little bit deeper into the particular services and counseling that's offered at national scholarships and fellowships? First of all, you know, for some high schoolers at home, what are some examples of them? Um, how can they be beneficial as students make themselves marketable in the job force, um, graduate school, et cetera? And then, and then talking specifically about how Emory helps um, our students get those opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. I would, you know, definitely take a look at the National Scholarships and Fellowships um, page. If you could just Google yeah. that and then add Emory to that. Again, you can search the listings and find the right opportunity for you. What I would say first and foremost is that for a lot of students at Emory, you know, four years is actually a lot of time and they feel really prepared to go into either the workforce or graduate school immediately upon graduation. However, we have a lot of students here that are just really passionate about the research that they're doing, they're passionate about the communities that they're building or the influence that they have within the different issues that they care about. And they might wanna spend a year or two studying those opportunities or getting to know a community that they care about. So things like the Fulbright, right? That comes out of the State Department and the US government, it's open to US citizens. It allows for students to do usually one year, sometimes extended to two, but typically one year of study um, in a foreign country focused on one of two things, either research, um, a topic that could include anything from STEM, social sciences, arts, and humanities of their choosing, and they get matched with the country and they're able to spend a year there. Um, there's also an ETA, English Teaching Award, that allows you uh, to actually forego the research component of this, but instead to spend a year in a community teaching English to the population in that country, right? So that's one example. The others are things like um, Goldwater or Watson or the Rhodes or the Marshall Fellowship, right? So the Rhodes is one of the most prestigious awards. Um, the reason that we have a National Scholarships and Fellowships Office, to your point about what does that office do, is because our students are not just competing with the other students across the country that are 
interested in those awards, the students are in some cases are actually competing with themselves, right? And so for things like uh, the Rhodes Scholarship, there's an internal nomination process where we can only put forth a number of students from Emory that are highly qualified and that are prepared to take on that effort. So we have a very smooth process where our students get nominated, they get uh, interviewed and selected, and then typically the dean of the college is the one to nominate and to send forth that person's application. Not every student is going to get a Rhodes Scholarship. It happens every few years, but a lot of our students get things like Fulbright and Marshall and Mitchell and Goldwater and um, other kinds of scholarships. For students that are interested in language study, we have the Critical Language Scholarship that is an example of an undergraduate scholarship. So everything I've talked about up until now has been mostly postgraduate. The CLS allows a student to go and study Arabic or Russian or Farsi or Chinese um, and to get that immersive experience, come back and continue learning that language, supported financially again by the State Department. So Alex, what I would say is that if you've got any kind of passing interest in getting off campus, doing something global, learning a language, meeting a community, take a look at those fellowships. And if it's listed on our website, that means that there's a dedicated advisor that will help you understand the rules and the ways to be competitive. And there's that emotional and kind of academic support that is there to make sure that your application is very strong and that it meets the standards of what we're typically seeing uh, Emory alumni and Emory students pursue. I'm glad you bring up um, getting off campus and and really taking the knowledge that you learn in the classroom and, and doing something with it outside of the classroom. And I want to pivot, if we can, to kind of the more experiential learning side of things. I'm also talking a little bit about research. How accessible is funding available for, for students who, who might want to engage in experiential learning? a research opportunity. You already mentioned a couple of, of, of those funding opportunities, but if we can talk a little bit about how exactly accessible it is. And also, are students competing with graduate students um, for, for those kinds of research opportunities? Um, essentially, how abundant is research at Emory for undergraduates? Yeah, let me just take that last part. Typically, our students at the undergraduate level are not competing with our graduate students for research opportunities. There's something called REUs, and those are our research experiences for undergraduates. And most R1 institutions like Emory provide those through programs like the SHORE program that I mentioned earlier, um, but also some of our national institutes like the National Institutes for Health, um, the CDC and others that are co-located. The CDC, by the way, is on Emory property. It's a, a huge government agency that allows our students to also get exposure to those researchers and scientists. Um, so students can get research experience on campus through our Emory faculty. They can also go off campus to other universities or other institutes to do that research. The internship funding that I talked about earlier, if it's on the research side of things, gets distributed through our undergraduate research programs office. And we also are able to provide a curricular component to research so that if students are doing an REU at another institution, they can actually get Emory credit for that. And what we've done is we've waived the tuition for both research Emory credit and also internship credit. So you're gonna get um, something on your transcript that shows that you did the internship or the research experience in this case, but you won't have to pay tuition for it. And we waive the fees for that as well, which is really, really important because that funding that we provide to students to pursue research, Alex, is actually donated by Emory alumni, right? And so we had uh, over the $850,000 that we distributed last summer to those 274 students, which meant that they could say yes to their ideal research or internship experience. Um, you know, the final things around funding um, are actually less about going to do research over the summer and more about that in time proposals. And so our students are often traveling to present their research at national and global uh, conferences and professional association meetings along with faculty. And we also provide some seed funding for students to actually just pay for the research needs that they might have. It might be equipment, it might mean travel, uh, and we have a program that supports all of that. I am working with a student who's been doing research and is presenting it at conferences across the country. And I I envy all the travel that she's able to do. It's it's really fantastic and all and supported by the university as well. Um, so we talk a lot about the STEM areas. We we are very strong as a university in STEM, but I think and and you mentioned this. Emory and Atlanta are very attractive places to, to study the arts, to engage very deeply and meaningfully in the arts. Can you talk a little bit about that specific career community, how Emory academically and 
co-curricularly support students with interest in the arts, what kind of internship opportunities and experiential learning opportunities are available. Um, and then perhaps if you know off the top of your head what students may do with, um, with, with an arts degree or arts experience as an undergraduate. Yeah, you're speaking my language here. Um, even though my day job is to lead the Pathway <laughs> Center, I'm a former professional musician, pianist and organist, and I also uh, do some co-producing on Broadway, which we can talk about another time. But um, <laughs> the reason that's so important to me is because I think that you know the world of work in 2024 is, is big enough for us to do a lot of different things as professionals, right? And so for students, what's important to know is that you might have a passion for the arts, but you might actually want to major in something else. Or maybe you're passionate about understanding the arts, but you don't want to go the conservatory route for grad school, you just want to, you know, be an educator or be an appreciator of music. All of that is perfectly fine. What I would say is I'll start locally. We've got an associate dean for the arts. His name is Kevin Carnes. He's a great colleague of mine. And he is responsible for activating the arts community across the campus, whether it's performing visual, multimedia, or, or other kinds of arts, right? And so there's great concerts that come to our campus. We've got the Schwartz Center, which is an incredible venue if you're into classical music or choral music or orchestral music. Um, the other piece that I'll say is that Atlanta itself is a burgeoning art scene. We've got the Beltline, which is about street art and graffiti and graphic art, but we also have uh, one of the top 10 operas in the country. The Atlanta Opera was just named one of the top 10 operas in the country this past year, which means that they've reached the level of um, income and uh, professionalism that you would expect at places like the Met or the Santa Fe Opera, right? Um, the other piece I would say is getting involved in theater. We've got the Alliance Theater. We've got Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater here, which is a historically Black theater. Um, and these folks are doing Broadway productions right and left. Kenny Leon just got nominated for Tony Awards last year for Top Dog, Underdog, and other kinds of things. I mention all of this first and foremost because these are things our students participate in. And there are also things that students can get involved in when it comes to apprenticeships and shadowing and working with faculty. Sheila Cavanaugh in the English department is a Shakespearean scholar and an incredible uh, researcher. She's seen probably every Shakespeare play known to humankind. But most importantly, you know, our students are getting that performance experience, right? And so, again, you might find yourself in one of the ensembles, maybe pay, playing gamelan, which is a very different sounding instrument that comes from Southeast Asia, right? Um, and that kind of performance gives our students transferable skills around self-confidence, around public speaking. I cannot tell you how important it is to be able to stand in front of a group of people and feel completely calm and at ease. And sometimes our students are getting that, um, that calm and ease through performance and through singing or dancing, right? So the lesson here for me is that there's many opportunities to get involved in arts and in music and dance and theater, visual arts, uh, media, film and media. Um, Tyler Perry Studios is a place where our students spend time at. There's also uh, Electric Owl, I think is the name, a new film studio that just opened up, plus the assembly, an even bigger studio than Tyler Perry. Um, these are all things that are drivable in our backyard. So Marvel films here, some of my best friends are stuntmen for things like the Marvel series. So, you know, you don't have to go to LA to experience this. You can get it right here in Atlanta. Um, but on the other hand, we provide opportunities for, for students to get involved. We funded students that went and did um, a piano festival in Prague this past summer that did um, opera workshops in, in Italy and et cetera. So obviously I could go on and on about this, but um, you know, the short answer is that if you wanna get involved in the arts, Emory is a really great place to get involved. And fun fact, couple of fun facts, many Marvel movies have filmed on Emory's campus, both of our campuses in Atlanta and Oxford. And Tyler Perry was our commencement speaker back in 2022, I believe just before you joined Emory, Brandon. That's right. Um, yes, yeah, arts are fantastic. Um, I, I do. Can y'all can can you hear me? It's saying my Zoom crashed. We can hear you. Yeah, there you okay, are. Perfect. Back. Okay, I'm back. Fantastic. So I want to pivot to business um, because Atlanta is a booming business scene. Emory, attractive place for students to study business. Number one, do you have to study business to go into a business? Yeah, you, you broke up there a little bit, but I think the question is, do you have to study business in order to go into business? And um, you actually don't have to. Can you hear uh -oh. me? I can hear you now. Okay. Like I'm back. So okay. 
I was just answering the question that I think you asked, which is, you know, if yeah. you want to work in business, do you have to study business? Yeah. Um, of course, the answer is no, because, um, you know, you can actually study econ or math or even other things and combine those majors with business, um, the business community. We do have a business career community that doesn't require a certain major. Anyone can join. And so we did have our networking event with alumni at BlackRock this, this past year. We also took a career track to New York City. We went to JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, KKR, Apollo, and looked at finance and Wall Street careers. Um, that was a mix of undergraduate Emory College students, but also the business school students, the BBAs, um, and Coisbeta School of Business. Um, the great news now, I think, is that a lot of our college students who are really passionate about things like the arts or humanities or social sciences can also get a business minor, right? And so if you're able to think about that extra polish that you might need, maybe it's the ability to manipulate a, an Excel spreadsheet and do pivot tables, it might be, um, you know, needing to do some analysis, not all the time, but things that might give you that extra leg <clears throat> up in an interview process with the corporation. Uh, all of that is doable um, at Emory, um, regardless of whether you get a business major. What I would tell any student who's considering a business major is that if you love marketing, if you love entrepreneurship, if you love accounting and you love finance, then you should probably be a business major. <laughs> but if you don't love any of those things and you really want to study the other things that maybe you loved in high school, history, anthropology, women and gender studies, um, these are things you can combine with a business minor or mm -hmm. just get an internship at your company of choice, which will certainly prepare you for the world of work. Um, the vast majority of our students, no matter what their major is, go into the private sector. Um, that is where the jobs are in this particular market. But those um, jobs um, include things like environmental justice. They include things like um, paying attention to the different populations that you might be serving, um, making sure that there's sustainability measures at that company. Those are called corporate social responsibility roles. And so combining your values with um, a business opportunity is really common for our students. Yeah. And the business minor that you mentioned was actually something students requested. Um, because they wanted a flexible way to study business without diving maybe deeper than they want to. And it's gotten fantastic feedback and so many students are engaging with it. Now, if I do want to study business, how does advising work that started those first two years in the Pathway Centers on both campuses, how, how does that translate and how does the Pathway Center work with the business school to help those students um, as they yeah, continue? It's a, it's a great question. I mean, Emory is a big place, as I mentioned before. Career yeah. professional development is a group of 15 uh, career advisors that work in the Career Center, which is located in the Pathway Center. But every school and college has their own um, you know, career center. And the Career Management Center at the Goizueta School of Business is someone that is a group that we partner with regularly. And so you might have uh, an opportunity from one of the banks or one of the big consulting firms like Deloitte or EY or KPMG or PwC, when those companies come on campus to recruit, they're not just looking for business majors, they're looking for anyone who's got the skills to be qualified for those jobs and internships. And so we work very closely with our counterparts in the business school to make sure that Emory College students have just as much access to those opportunities as our BBA students do and vice versa, right? And so none of those opportunities are locked out from each other. We share those widely. Um, when it comes to our big career fairs that happen on campus, usually at uh, the middle to end of September, we're also partnering with the business school, with nursing and with Oxford to make sure that the students are able to pursue all those in, those internships. They learn about the fair on Handshake, they register on Handshake. There's a lot of virtual events that happen on Handshake as well. And then finally, we have a dedicated staff member that sits in career and professional development, half of whose job is to pay attention to the business students and half of whose job is to pay attention to the college students. This person is not a career advisor that actually is outside of her scope, but she's there to make sure the recruitment opportunities are open to both populations. So there's nothing lost if you are a business major and there's also nothing lost if you stay in the college. And I would say what matters most, Alex, is that you study what you love, you study what eventually comes pretty natural to you and that you feel like yeah. you're contributing to the work of that department. Brandon Grimmett, Vice Provost for Career and Professional Development, Associate Dean at Emory College and Director of the Pathway Center. Thank you so much for spending some time with us, Brandon. We appreciate it. Thank you, Alex. And good luck, everyone, with your decision. All right. And that's going to do it for us this evening. Thank you all for bringing us into your homes during these truly exciting times. As I mentioned, we have many other in-person and virtual engagements available for you to learn more about what life is like as an Emory student. And I encourage you to visit your admitted student website for more information about registration.
I would also encourage you to check out our Welcome to College platform where you can securely message with current Emory students. If there's any way that we can assist you as you help make your enrollment decision, please do not hesitate to contact the Office of Admission. I'm posting a couple of important links in the chat. And again, thank you all very much for joining us on this very exciting day and have a fantastic rest of your evening. Bye now.